Second Chronicles chapter 16, and then we'll read verse 11. <clears throat> Let's see right here. The Bible says, And behold the acts of Asa, first and last. Lo, they are written in the books of the king, a book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. <laughs> and Asa slept with his fathers and died in the one and fortieth year of his reign. And they buried him in his own sepulchres, which he had made for himself in the city of David, and laid him in the bed which was filled with sweet odors and divers kinds of spices prepared by the apothecary's art. And they made a very great burning for him. Now, Asa, King Asa, during this time, he actually lived a life where at the beginning he sought after the Lord. He did what was right. And he tried to follow God's will. He had a lot of faith. He was up against the Ethiopian army. However, what happened is somehow, in some way here, he fell down. He lost his faith in the Lord. He relied on other people. Relied on secular humanist ways, his own plans, rather than the Lord. As a matter of fact, the verse reads, which some people have preached out of, very, very sobering. It says right here that when he was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceeding great, yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. My question to you today is, are there some doctors that you're relying on who can't heal your diseased feet? We have to understand that in a day and age, we are, you don't want to admit this, but you are sick diseased people and that's why you need a doctor who you can rely on and cure i don't think a lot of us realize that we live in a society where we think that our life is our own and we just move on with life we can make decisions what we want but we don't realize that we do have diseased stinky feet that's rotting away and that we're hardly walking, we're hardly able to go on in life, in our own Christian walk. You can't go on in your Christian walk with stinky feet. And you need a doctor to cure you. But nowadays we rely on doctors, whether it be fame, job, prosperity, okay. income, money, socializing, or even church. Okay. And that's why there are a lot of people who go to church but they're still not right with God. If you don't think so, then why are 90% of the churches here, they're apostate. If you faithfully go to the churches there, you still mess up. See? So there are a lot of people with stinky feet. And you can't rely on doctors who are unreliable. There's only one great physician and healer, and that is Jesus Christ. I wonder what kind of doctors you're relying on with your feet. I hope that today's preaching will open your eyes. The title of my message is Silly Doctors and Stinky Feet. Let's pray. Amen. Father God, there are people who have stinky feet here. I'm one to talk myself. I cannot go on without holding your hand. I pray that they will come to know this great physician like I do today. And that uh, you'll touch their hearts. Make them uh, open their hearts and minds to see the unreliable doctors that they have entrusted all this time. Holy Spirit, move upon this message, and Heavenly Father, please speak to them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Now, my first point is going to be quite a while. I'm going to park on this first point for quite a while, and then the next four points I'm going to resume briefly because I want us to understand our disease and our issue, because we don't realize that. My first point is relying on Ben-Hadad. Relying on Ben-Hadad. Look at verse 1. Verse 1 of chapter 16 in our main text. The Bible says in the 6th and 30th year, uh, the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah and built Ramah to the intent that he might let none go out or come into Asa, king of Judah. 
Then Asa brought out silver and gold out of the treasures of the house of the Lord and of the king's house, and sent to Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, that dwelt at Damascus, saying, There is a league between me and thee, as there was between my father and thy father. Behold, I have sent thee silver and gold. Go break thy league with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. Now, notice right here that King Asa, he was about to be overrun by another king. His name was Baasha. So he relied on the Syrian king, Ben-Hadad, to deliver him from his problem. And I believe that is a problem with a lot of people that are relying on Ben-Hadad here. I want you to discover if your silly doctor, Ben-Hadad, if your doctor, Ben-Hadad, is the one you're truly relying on to take care of your issue. Do you have a Ben-Hadad in your life? Some of you don't realize that you have a Ben-Hadad in your life. In other words, a person that you truly, or a thing that you truly rely upon to resolve the issues or you depend upon in life. There are things that you should rely on and there are things that you shouldn't rely on. Let me repeat that again. There are things in life that you should rely on and there are things in life that you shouldn't rely on. You should rely on the Word of God. You should rely in your relationship with Jesus Christ. You should rely on God's leading and guidance in your life, even if it contradicts your own. You got to rely on an assembly, a Bible-believing church that he has given to you, and not just a normal church, but a Bible-believing church. You should rely on the spiritual things of God that he has given to you to do. He told you to win souls to salvation. He told you to stay away from sin. He told you to believe in right doctrine. He, believe, he teaches you to spread the truth to other people. The uh, teaching and the right doctrines to others, not just yourself. These are things that you should rely on. If there are opportunities in your life that you have, you should rely on these things. Friends, family members, a pastor that are Bible believers. But you shouldn't rely on, on a family that's broken and spiritually weak. A pastor that is a false pastor. Or friends that are of the world who have a wrong influence on you. And that's why you fall back to the same sin again. There are things you shouldn't rely on such as your worldly gains. Your worldly goals, because they will distract you in life. There are things you shouldn't rely on. Your sin. Sin is such an addiction and a trap, and it will only bring you further down to a pit of despair. You shouldn't rely on despair either. There are people who get so hooked on that one, and they get depressed easily again, and that's why there are people who commit suicide. You shouldn't rely on the government. You shouldn't rely on your job. You shouldn't rely on your money. You shouldn't rely on your education or the future of the education school and everything that you plan out for your child. You forgot God. You got to rely on God. These things are very easy to rely on. Why? Because, let's be honest, no money, I can't buy food. No education, it's going to be hard to find a job. No roof over my head, then how are we going to meet as a church and work more efficiently. Sure, we can do outdoors, but sometimes to people that's difficult to do. See, this is natural to us. What's natural to us is there are things that we rely on, but we don't realize those aren't good things. And then the good things we should rely on, those are the last things we tend to do, unfortunately. The truth is everything you do in life there is something you rely on. We have to understand that. Everything in life, there is something you do that you rely on. Some people don't realize that. You think that you're your own man, your own woman, but to be quite honest, you are a person who's very dependable or depending on something. That's what I meant. You don't realize that. There's some, uh, you are a person who needs something, who depends on something. You can't go on life completely being your own. There is something in life you rely on. Let me say this is, if you, we were to take away everything that you had in life, the things that you're used to doing, okay? If we were to take all these things away from you because you got sick, so 
uh, the things that you are preoccupied on, whether it was a certain hobby or job or studying that you were doing. Let's say that these things that you are preoccupied and usually that you do throughout your day is taken away from you because of your sickness. And you're sick in bed all day and you're like, what's the first thought in your mind? This is miserable, right? <laughs> this is miserable. Uh, you might recall the time that I was out for quite a while. And my goodness, when all these things were taken away from me, I'm like, this is just horrible. I mean, even if we have church problems, at least I'm preoccupied with something, right? But take away everything, and I'm like, wow, this is the first time in my life I just did nothing. <laughs> and you get so antsy, and you just feel miserable. That's the one word, it's just miserable. You get antsy, you want to do something, but there's nothing to do. Why is that? See, it's because your body and mind is used to doing something. But sick in bed, you're getting antsy. And when you're getting that antsy feeling, what is it that you're wanting to do? See, your body is longing to do something. There's something you're relying on, aren't you? See, whether you believe it or not, everything that you have in life or do, there's something you rely on. If you don't believe me, just be sick in bed all day and let's see if there's nothing that you want to do or something your body craves or urges to do, something it relies on, see? But here's a big eye opener. What's really sad is you might be the one who's sick in bed all day, getting antsy to do something, but there's nothing to do, and God has given you his word and prayer. Come on, brother. And guess what? You don't do those things. Isn't that a little bit of an eye-opener and a shocker? Yeah. yeah. What's shocking is the body and your life longs to do something. It craves to do something. There's no doubt about it because there's something in life you rely upon. And if you don't believe that, just be sick in bed all day. And don't tell me that you, you'll be antsy enough to do something. It's craving. It's longing to do something. But what's so sad is it's it longing to get back to work or to school, of all things, rather than the word of God in prayer. Come on, brother. Preach. And that will be a huge eye-opener to you. You know what my point is? My point is, there are things that you rely on that's fleshly, yeah. more than things that you rely on spiritually. And that's sad. Right. That's, good. that's real sad. You know what's extremely dangerous? This is the cause for all, a lot of your problems, okay? So listen up now. The reason why you've got a lot of issues in your life is because all this time, perhaps you were relying on those fleshly things to keep you going rather than the spiritual things of God. And you hardly relied on the spiritual thing of God to keep you going. Isn't that sad? Is that you today? You know what's uh, even more of an eye-opener? Some people, uh, when they skip church, you know what they're thinking? They're thinking, I don't need to go to church that day. In other words, when they say, I don't need to go to church that day, they don't rely on a Bible-believing church to go to where they can hear preaching and teaching to keep them right with God. People, when they skip Bible reading and prayer, they're thinking, yeah, I don't need it that day. What does that mean? They're not relying on that spiritual word of God and prayer to keep them going. That's scary, right? But if you're sick in bed all day, you're like, oh, I need to get back to work. Oh, I need to at least do something physical or fleshly. I just want to go out and... Ah, so notice right here, your true intention is you're relying on fleshly physical things to do. Right there. But then the spiritual things of God, you go, oh, I don't need to go to church. I don't really need to read the Bible, pray. You say, you're saying that you don't need those spiritual things? You know what that is? Dangerous. You're saying, I don't need the spiritual thing of God, but I need a fleshly, physical thing. Preach. Do you honestly believe when you live 10 years of your life that way, you're not going to do serious damage to yourself? Double preach. Because this is opening your eyes a bit. There's something you're relying on more. That's the reason why people just pay money for a thera 
uh, therapy for psychiatrists. Why? Because the true intention of the heart is something physical and fleshly that can meet their fleshly mind and sensation rather than the word of God. Rather than walking by faith and trusting God with the problem. Why? Because all this time you relied upon something fleshly rather than something spiritual. It's very dangerous. If you're living that life, especially if, you're, if you lived your life for over 20 years, which I think pretty much uh, most of the people here is over 20. If you live most of your life more than 20 years that way, you're on dangerous ground. You and I, you and I should have been dead a long time ago, mate, basically. Do you honestly believe you're not going to die when you keep relying on that fleshly thing to keep you going in life without that spiritual thing? You and I should have died a long time ago. Why are we not dead, Pastor? Only the grace and mercy of God. But you can't keep tempting the Lord. And you need to realize, and it's high time now, that you get out of that relying state on the flesh and start to rely on the spiritual things of God. You do have a Ben-Hadad, whether you believe it or not. Notice right here that at verse 2, Ben-Hadad's the one that Asa relied upon. Get me out of this problem and predicament situation. So he's willing to give up his silver and gold. Something so precious and valuable to him and to his whole nation. Because he trusted Ben-Hadad that much. And he relied on Ben-Hadad to take care of the issue. It's so amazing. You don't pray. You don't read the word of God. But you pay silver and gold for a psych psychiatric treatment, huh? That's amazing to me. Whether you believe it or not, you have a Ben-Hadad. That's a temptation. Ben-Hadad here basically represents temptation. He pictures temptation right here that you rely upon whether you know it or you don't. Whether you know it or not, there's a Ben-Hadad. Basically how we can tell your Ben-Hadad is if there was a fearful thing that happened to you right now, what is the first response, the first reaction you will do? Call 911? Look at your income amount to use the money. Here's the, I know what you do. The first thing is you let the mind and the emotions of the heart run. That's the first thing you do. You don't immediately trust and obey the Lord. You have a Ben Hadad, and that is a temptation that you rely upon. A temptation and an instinct that is your first impulsive reaction to things in life. And that is your sin, your weakness that keeps eating up your life. And you've been li living over 20 years that way. It's a miracle you're still walking and breathing. You're on dangerous ground. But not only do you have a Ben Hadad, you have to realize this. There will always be a Basha. You might say, what do you mean by that? There will always be a Baasha, but people don't believe that Baasha has happened to them. You'll notice that verse 1, in the 6th and 30th year of the reign of Asa, Baasha, king of Israel, came up against Judah. Baasha came up to attack Asa. Now, your problem is this, is that you think that you live in a life where tomorrow it's going to be expected and natural I'm going to drive to work, get money, and then go back home and do the thing that I want to do. That's your problem. You don't expect that the devil might just come tomorrow, Amen. send in some kind of an attack, and you might have a flat tire, or something bad will happen to your job that day, or when you go back home, a fight might erupt, and, oh, I just want to get some peace, but I don't get peace. Amen. You don't expect that. Why? That's Baasha. Baasha is an interference, a trial that comes up in your life. You think you live in a life with zero trials. As long as you live your life as a good American, your plans are all thought out, your goals are all planned out, and then you made sure that you covered all the nooks and crannies of everything, then life should go as well as you would want it to be. And you have a goal and a dream of, well, I'm going to buy a bigger house, 
I'm going to get a promotion. I'm going to get better money. I'm going to have more time in my hands to do these things. And I've got a family to think about in the future. Uh, 401k, retirement, and everything. And that's your problem. You don't think, you don't believe a Baasha will still come out in spite of how well your 401k plan is. Preach. Double preach. You know that? America thought that they were invincible and immutable and everything would go well. Look at the past three years. Crummy life. No matter how great your plans are, no matter how good your life is, you better believe it. There will still be a Basha. He ain't going away. Why? Because there's always a devil. Do you remember that sermon that I preach? There's always a devil. A trial will happen in your life. And when Baasha comes, that's where you realize, or most of the time, sadly, you don't realize. When Baasha comes, what's the first instinct you do? Pray to the Lord and say, God, I'll trust you with this trial and believe, no matter what. And then you go to church, read the Bible, pray. No! The first instinct is the flesh. That's the first thing that happens that the trial comes out. Yeah. The flesh, the flesh, whatever your flesh tends to do. Baasha will come out and prove to you there is something you rely on. What is the first instinct of your flesh when a Baasha comes up in your life, huh? Is it using your money? Is it going by your plans? Is it remaining arrogant and stubborn in your own ways? Is it just to live in fear and despair and there's nothing that can be helped? What is it? What is the tendency that you rely on, that you do when Baasha comes up. Now, let me give you a bigger eye-opener than that. You ready for this? Preach. If you have a Ben-Hadad, and you come to realize, okay, I have a Ben-Hadad in my life, a, a tendency, a temptation, a weakness that I have that I always resort to. If you have a Ben-Hadad, and also there is always a Baasha that comes out, and that's that trial that causes you to do the first instinct that you resort to do, that you rely on. So if there is always a basha that will come out, what if you have both of them together? Wouldn't that be a deadly combination? So if you have a ben Hadad, which is temptation, and you have a basha, which is trial, Combined together, the thing you're relying on becomes an addiction. Double bridge. A normalcy that you occasionally and habitually do, but you don't realize it. Bridge. And this deadly thing you rely upon, if it's not the spiritual thing of God, becomes so dangerous that you've been living that way for 20 years or more that you think, Everything around the world goes the way that you rely on. And that's how the world works. And if the world don't operate that way, then you think that my Christianity is a flop and you got every reason to be bitter. Am I making any sense or is this too deep for you? It becomes an unbreakable habit and you think, I was just born this way. I just, uh, you don't know about my past or, you know, this is something that Unless you were in my shoes, I habitually did. The addiction is so strong. You can't understand that. That's what it comes down to. Why? Because you kept having a Ben Hadad and Basha kept coming out and you combine those two dark forces together that and you thought that and you think that you're doomed to this life and nothing can change it. No, with Jesus Christ, a great physician, he can change anybody and cure any disease. Amen. Amen. No matter how great the Ben Hadad is or, or how great the boss is. Amen. 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 When you got those two B's combined, it's really bad. Basha Ben Hadad. But when you get three B's combined, build back better. Oh, you're in horrible, you're in a horrible situation there. All of this ties together, those bees that I pointed out. It's all about what you're relying on, see? The things of the flesh and not the spiritual things of God. And it's become such, such a dangerous thing to you. It affects.
affected your life, it affected your behavior, your conversation, and now you're doomed. And you think that you're doomed, that you'll forever stick this way and nothing can change it. And that's why, sadly, there are LGBTQ people that think I was just born this way, rather than thinking that it was a choice that they made. Why? Because Baasha is so frequently happening to them, and the Ben Hadad they're holding on to so deeply, it became them that they thought they were born with it. You know what you need to do? You need to start looking at your Ben Hadads, and you need to start looking for those Baashas. You need to go back through the past 20 years of your life and start finding out what are my Ben Hadads and what are my Baashas. That caused me to keep relying on those wrong things. Double amen. Double three. Look, even if there are some things that are even difficult to do, if it's something you strongly rely on, you still do it. You know that? A person who gets into heroin, and that's something he relies on, and it's so bad, that addiction, they don't care if they have to go poor for it, spend every dime for it, lose their health for it, lose their sanity, have broken relationships with family and friends just for that feeling of heroin. Why? Because that's something they strongly rely on. People don't care how bad the workplace is or how difficult the education is because they rely on those things so strongly to make a future for themselves. No matter how difficult the thing is, if you rely on it very strongly, you'll still do it. Isn't that true? Why can't you do that with Jesus Christ if you can do that with the things of this world? Oh, it's so hard to serve Jesus Christ. <laughs> Same thing with the world. You think it's easy to serve the world? The things of this world has become difficult too. There are some things in this world that were difficult for you. You had some bad instances in the workplace, bad instances in school, bad instances with your own life. Even sin itself that you played with, there are sometimes it was difficult to achieve that or to grab that for yourself, wasn't it? Where you lied and sneaked around. So, I mean, if those things are difficult to do, yet you still do them, why can't you do that with Jesus? Oh, it's so hard to go to church, read the Bible, pray, and something like that. Not if you relied on Jesus so strongly like heroin. Not if you relied on Jesus so strongly as you do with other fleshly things that has caused you to go through sleepless nights. So you don't know what rely means, do you? That's why. You know what rely means? It's putting your full confidence... So, so much confidence in that thing. That's an absolute confidence that it satisfies your mind. It satisfies you. Preach. Jesus does not mean that much to you. Whoa. Preach. You don't truly, fully put your confidence and faith in him. That it satisfies everything to you. That's your problem. No, you rely on the science of this world so much and look at how the science of this world has helped society today the past years. This will keep me safe. And then, no, they're still living in a state of fear. Do you rely on Jesus Christ that much? No, you don't. You don't rely on the spiritual thing you're supposed to do for God that much. You rely on ben Hadad, And then Baasha keeps coming into your life. And some of you are thinking, man, my life is so hard, difficult. You don't know what I've been through, preacher. And uh, yeah, you can tell me this suggestion and that suggestion to help better out my life. But you just don't really understand my problem. If you believe in that, then you just admit it. There is a Baasha. That's very great. So there's a great Baasha with your Ben Hadad. You think you can live the next 30 years of your life that way? Preach. Because that basha, that problem of yours, is such a difficult, great problem, it should urge you more to flee to Jesus Christ Amen. and rely on him. Amen. Amen. Is your basha great? Is your ben Hadad difficult to overcome? Then you need to hear this message. And you need Amen. to find your true reliance on Jesus Christ and get rid of your false reliances. Amen. The Lord is sadly 
not the one we truly rely on as our only means. Do you understand that? That's what re how you can put full confidence in the Lord and not put a single reliance on a fleshly, worldly thing. Just only think about, God, you're my only means, my only thing that I can rely on to even breathe and go on with the next plan in my life. When you live your life that way and God is in every decision you make, every thought you think, every heart that beats and feels, and every word that you say, every action that you do, how can you go wrong? You can never go wrong if God is in everything yeah. of those things. He is. And that's because you relied on him, only him, for anything and everything you do. Christ alone. Amen. Is God truly the one you rely on as your only means? When you skip your Bible reading and prayer and something spiritual for the Lord, think about this. You just starved yourself that day. You just went a day without water. What do you do when you skip a meal, when you skip water to drink? The, you cannot go on. You crave, you long, you say, all I want is a drop of water to drink. And that's where your true reliance should be on Jesus Christ. God, I cannot go on without a single word from your book. God, I can't go on without a single sermon that I hear to keep me going. God, I cannot go on without the fellowship with the brethren. God, I cannot go on without praying to you and giving my problem and burden to you. God, I cannot go on without one soul being witnessed to. God, I cannot go on without having my doctrine straightened out. God, I cannot go on that is all I rely on as my water to drink. Amen. And that will get you to rely on Jesus Christ. Is Amen. you start to remember the Holy Spirit nature in you that's crying out for thirst because you haven't read that book for years. Wow. Now we go on to verse 4 through 6. My second point is relying on building. Relying on building. You'll notice that uh, verse 4 through 6, And Ben-Hadad hearkened unto King Asa, and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel. And they smote Aijan, and Dan, and abel Maim and all the store cities of Naphtali. And it came to pass, when Baasha heard it, that he left off building of Ramah, and let his work cease. Then Asa the king took all Judah, and they carried away the stones of Ramah, and the timber thereof, wherewith Baasha was building, and he built therewith Geba and Mizpah. Now, you notice right here that Asa's plan worked. It didn't fail. It worked. Asa's plan where Ben-Hadad helped him out worked. And Asa's like, wow, this is great. That's why he keeps doing it. Because his plan worked. I heard what that preacher preached about, you know, that it's not going to work. But guess what? Preacher, you're wrong. It did work. My plan worked. You say that it's too worldly or sinful or, you know, I got to be careful. I got to pray about it, go by God's will. But look at this. It worked. And I'm going to keep doing it. So he keeps doing it. You'll notice right here that when Basha left the building of his own work, Asa took over Baasha's work and kept building upon it. You know what your problem is? You're building upon the Baasha and the Ben-Hadad that you've come to rely upon so much. What's so dangerous is that Ben-Hadad and Baasha only confirmed your suspicion, your great plan, your thought, your deepest fears or your deepest desires and Basha and Ben Hadad confirmed it and you're like I'm right see I'm right and I know that I read that in the book and the preacher preached that way and they're telling me something different but guess what I was right so I'm going to keep building upon what I've always suspected and what I've always believed what I've always desired why because your Ben Hadad, your Baasha, confirmed that what you relied on was good enough. There's nothing wrong with what I relied on. It worked. So I'm going to keep going this way. So you build upon it. 
What you rely on, guys, it doesn't stay there. What you rely on, you build upon it. Mm, that's good, brother. And you start building. You, you, you make that, ba you make that Ben Hadad, the thing that you relied on, even bigger now. And you build it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And what became the first instinct of your flesh you relied on became something normal to you. And then you built upon it even more where you believed in that now. Not just it became normal to you to do it. It's something you believed in now. That this is right. And no matter what other people say, they're wrong. It made you a firm believer in it. And that's dangerous. You know what God says about sin? When you're hooked onto sin, then sin can deceive you. And God will give you a believable lie. A lie that looks so true that you can't see what's wrong with it. Now you're relying on your building. Because it worked. Your plan worked. Nothing wrong with it. But you don't realize that that's the devil's trick, is that you forget one key word about sin. It's temporary. And that is your big problem. Temporary. I don't care if it worked for you for the whole year. I don't care if it worked for you for two years, three years, four years, five years, ten years, or even till the day you die, which I highly doubt. But I highly doubt it. But even if it went the entire lifetime, that lifetime is still temporary to the eternal mind of God who counted thousands of lifetimes, not just yours. Amen. He saw a bigger picture where you only saw yours. That's good, brother. You forget that what you're relying on is temporary. Yeah. Oh, it works. Sin is pleasurable. Guarantee a promise. Temporarily. Temporarily, for a short time only. Yep. Everything is. And this is even worse, is that what you forget is when it's temporary, what does that mean? The repercussion what? of that sin that you made, of that fleshly thing you relied on, is going to hit you. Yep. And it will hit you, remember this, it will hit you hard. Some of you are reaping what you're sowing, but you, didn't, you don't even realize it right now. That's even scarier. Some of you are reaping what you're sowing right now, but you don't even realize it. You know what you're doing? Just like all these liberals, finding somebody else to blame for the problems of what we're going through in our country. That's what you Christians are doing, is that when, these, when Basha keeps coming out, the problems keeps coming out, you think, no, 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 it's what I'm relying on always works. I believe it. It's not... What I'm relying on is the problem, my fleshly thing. It's that preacher, yeah. that church. And I remember that pastor overlooked that thing and that brother and sister in Christ talked bad about me, that thing. And I remember that time that, you know, and then you blame it on your parents, your family, and then you go on to every cat and dog that runs around and you blame everything out there. Come on. Except your Ben Hadad because it works so well. That's dangerous. Yeah. Why? Because I told you, when you combine Ben-Hadad and Baasha, yeah. it becomes a deadly combination. Yeah. Double preach. And you're building on it, and that consequence is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. You know what happens when you're reaping what you've sown? If I, you, I repent, get right with God, and get God to resolve that. Amen. Pain doesn't... Pain and repercussion of sin don't go away, but at least it's going to be shorter, that consequence. Just railroad through it, get it over with. But no, you keep running away from it. You keep running away from the consequence of your sin and relying on Ben Hadad. And you know what that consequence has become? Bigger now. And even bigger. And even bigger. So big that even if you get away from it, it's going to hit somebody. And it will hit your loved ones. Why? Because you were the one who refused to repent. So now it's going to affect somebody else you hold dear to you. That's why, my good, don't keep building on Ben Hadad. You know what you're doing? You're building on a greater damnation. Wow. 
Now, I know that you're not, uh, you're, I'm not saying you lose your salvation, you go to hell. Right. But damnation, what that means in the Bible, it's kind of like condemnation. Right. It means like punishment. That's what I mean. And you're just building up that damnation of yours bigger and bigger and bigger. And when that damnation comes, boom, and that's why you feel like your life is hell right now, isn't it? Come on. Because you forgot the past 20 years of your life, how you lived your life uh, in sin. Uh, Come on, brothers. You're You're, you know what a majority of people are doing right now? This is scary. You're in this point, the second point, building. building. That's where you're at right now. You're building it because it works. It's your first tendency to do stuff and it became normal to you. You're building it even more. Scary. Verse 7 through 9. The Bible says, my third point, relying on blunders, relying on blunders. Now look at this. Verse 7, and at that time, Hanani, the seer, came to ask the king of Judah and said unto him, because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, Ben-Hadad, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lumens, uh, Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and uh, horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Here in thou hast done foolishly. Therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. What I mentioned a little bit earlier is that even if uh, the repercussions of sin come from your blunders, you don't blame on your blunders. Come on. You try to find something else to blame. And that's so dangerous because then you blind yourself from seeing the weaknesses, the weak spots that you have, the blunders that you made. I don't know if you ever dealt with a person who's so Narcissist, who's such a narcissist that no matter how hard you try to point out the person what's the contradiction or the problem, the narcissist refuses to see the problem. And you can point out, here's things that you've overlooked. What about this problem, this problem, this problem? From your wrong decision and choice and behavior, Mr. Narcissist, you, here are things you've overlooked. Have you ever tried that with a person? And what does that nar narcissist do? do? Do they see the problem or do they still overlook it and they don't understand it? Narcissists will overlook it. They still won't understand it. That's you right now. Wow. What you are is you're relying on blunders. In spite of the blunders that you made in your life, you're such a narcissist. Your conscience has been seared with a hot iron that even if the preacher points out the direct problem, it's like, nope. God, mm, I don't get it. Why does he have to yell? He's preaching at me. Why, why is he preaching that sermon that day? Oh, he's just too mean. And, you know, he could better persuade people if he did it this way. And that's what happens. You overlook the problem. You overlook the, the blunders that you made. It becomes so dangerous. And there are three blunders you can find here. And I want you to see if you made the same blunders too. Okay? Let's look at the three blunders here. Three things that he overlooked. Because he thought his plan was so great, Asa. I'm going to rely on Ben Hadad. It worked. And I'm going to build on it. Let us see. Three things he overlooked. His great plan of build back better. Notice how it fell down. Look at this. First thing is in verse 7. In verse 7, it says, Because he relied on the king of Syria, not the Lord. Look at the last part. Therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. You know what that is? That verse says, Because... You kept resorting to Ben-Hadad so much. Ben-Hadad uh, ben is now escaped out of your hand. What does that mean? The sin or the fleshly, worldly thing that you relied on 
God has given you a chance to overcome it before it becomes bigger and before it becomes an addiction. But no, you let Ben-Hadad escape out of your hand. And the chance where you could have conquered worldly music at the age of five by not listening to it. No, you kept listening to that worldly music, Ben-Hadad so much that Ben-Hadad escaped out of your hand and now when you become a Bible believer and try to conquer worldly music, it's like, I can't shake it off of my mind. Right there. Preach. Why? You let Ben Hadad escape out of your hand. Oh, why do you have to preach against wrong doctrines and call out false preachers? I'm not letting Ben Hadad escape out of my hand. You know why? Because you do. You tolerate the Ben Hadads, and that's why they escaped out of your hand, and you don't see what's wrong with Calvinism from John MacArthur and uh, Paul Washer and then uh, Todd Friel from Wretched, and, and that's why you don't see what's wrong with uh, Joel Osteen and Joyce Meyer with Prosperity Gospel, because you tolerated it. You let Ben Hadad escape. You think I'm going to get away with Calvinism, Prosperity Gospel, modern Bible versions here? I'm not. You know why? I don't let Ben Haydad escape! Amen! Amen. But she stole it all mine. You gotta cut down your Ben Haydad. You tol this is a spirit of toleration. It makes me puke, man. There's one thing that I hate is the spirit of tolerating, tolerating, tolerating. You know what you're tolerating? Ben Haydad! And you let him escape out of your hand. There are some sins in your life, the worldly ambitions that you have, that you're so hard to overcome. Pastor, I'm not like you, where you, you know, go out to street preaching, soul winning is normal, and serving on, God and sacrificing on. the world. It's, I'm not like you. You don't understand my life. Yeah, yeah you know why? Ben Hadad was kicked out early in my life. Amen. Yours was late. It's better to conquer Ben Hadad earlier now. Amen. Amen. He's worthy. Amen. Triple preach. Am I saying I'm better than you? No, I'm not saying I'm better than you. I'm saying that I'm so blessed with the family who took Ben Hadad seriously and not accuse my parents of being unloving and too mean and then I would have had a Ben Hadad and be just like you. That's why I'm kicking Ben Hadad now. You need to kill it now because you're gonna have a next generation soon. Your next generation is growing up more. And then you're going to have the next generation after that. So you know what you need to do? Cut down Ben Hadad now! Amen. You're letting him run away every time. Every single time, every Sunday, when all the call is open, when you can get right with God and cut down Ben Hadad, you let him run away and get away. No, if I were you, I'd run down to this altar, catch Ben Hadad, and Amen. kill him on this altar. Amen. Amen. There's a second thing you overlooked. Fire. Wow, a second blunder I overlooked? The first blunder was bad enough, preacher. What is that? See, that's why you gotta take this sermon seriously. Yeah. There are three blunders. Yeah. I wonder what your second one is. The second one here, you notice at verse eight, he reminded him of God's blessing and said, remember what you experienced back then? When you relied on the Lord that time and God gave you a victory? No, he didn't remember. He forgot. Asa forgot that victory he had against the Ethiopians. Why? Because he relied on the Lord that time. But he forgot it. You know what your problem is? You forgot your answered prayers. Because you were too lazy to not write it down. You were too lazy not to thank him during your prayer time. And you forgot how God was so good to you. If you remember all the time God rescued you from impossible situations, wouldn't you rely on God for the rest of your life after that? You know why you don't? You forgot God rescuing you, rescuing you from those impossible scenarios. And because of that, you're like, I'm not going to rely on God. And you keep running to Ben Hadad, your fleshly ambition. You forgot the victories. You forget the victories called out in the testimonies here. People who testify to you that I lived like the world at a young age. Hey, teenagers, young people, don't go out after the world. It's not worth it. You forgot those victories, those blessings that could have rescued you. But no, you're like, no. You ignore the blessings. You forget them. 
You forget the time where God has provided your need on something and you, the ungrateful louse you are just said, well, that should be normal. I should get this good thing. That's your problem. Preach. You know what keeps me going in this church? No matter how bad the situation this church is, I remember every miracle, divine miracle. And I know a lot of you know those too. There is no doubt God's hand is on this church. And I know that in spite of the areas that we're in, that we will go on and God will bless it. You might say, why? I remember the miracles. I remember when the piano player had this crummy little thing and we couldn't hear him playing at all. And, you know, inside a, a humongous garage and, you know, with rain pouring down and everything. And the odds were stacked up against us. And then the poor preachers had a flimsy little music stand and how can you put anything on top of it? How can any soul get saved in street preaching or hear the gospel? But I remember those days in spite of those odds and those attacks, how the church has overcome. You think I'm going to doubt God after that and not rely on him? You forgot that's your problem. If you got those victories. Another thing you'll notice at verse 9, for the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Herein thou hast done foolishly. Here's the third thing you overlook. You, this is the greatest part. Your weakness. Right there. Your weak spot. And you know what they are. I don't have to tell you. I don't know you. I ain't going to tell you. Why? I'm not God. Not my business. I don't know what your weak spot is. Something that I think is your weak spot can be wrong. Did you realize that? Yeah, because I'm human. You and God know. Yeah, You're a big boy. You're a big girl. Why don't you start using your head and find out what your weak spot is? You know exactly what your weak spot is. And that's why you fell back to ben Hadad again. Your heart was not perfect toward God. That's why you never stop and check yourself. Before you blame the environment, before you blame on somebody, why don't you look at yourself and say, am I the problem here? Yeah. What have I overlooked? I didn't turn it to the Lord in prayer all this time. Right there. I haven't grown in the Lord. I'm still messing around with sin. I haven't served Jesus as much as I should have. Why don't you look at those things? That's why. Ben Hadad, uh, Basha came in, resorting for you to fall into Ben Hadad again, and Basha kept swinging you toward Ben Hadad because Basha is coming down and he's making you resort to your weak spot. Basha discovered your weak spot. There are thousands, if not legions, of devils out there who studied your behavior and pattern and watched you from birth till now. And they said, weak spot tendency is this, this, this of this Christian here. Preach. So let's keep hitting that. Preach. Preach. That's the third thing you overlooked. But what if you got your weaknesses right with God? If you got your weaknesses right with God, it's going to be hard for Basha to hit at your weak spot. And you'll be able to overcome Basha. You need to look at your weak spots. Amen. Amen. Conquer them. Look at verse 10 through 11. Verse 10 through 11. Uh, my fourth point is relying on bitterness. Relying on bitterness. Uh, notice right here. Then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in a prison house. For he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. And behold, the acts of Asa, first and last, lo, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. And Asa, in the thirty and ninth year of his reign, was diseased in his feet, until his disease was exceeding great. Yet in his disease he sought not to the Lord, but to the physicians. That is sad. This guy... He relied on himself so much, on the fleshly things so much, that if God were to poke a hole at him, 
or if it's a sermon that's not as hard, but just a little pointed, it's enough to make you angry and bitter. That's the generation we live in today. That when you get a person preaching on sin and hell, they're like super duper offended and get bitter. That they'd be happy if the government shut down that church. That's the day and generation we live in. You might say, why would they get angry and bitter? Just like you would get angry and bitter. There's always a good reason with you. You don't just get angry and bitter. You always have a good reason to become that way. <laughs> you might say, why is that? Why is that, Pastor? Because your ben Haydad always worked for you. So you were never wrong because you found something else to blame out there. Right. And because of that, that's why you keep up with this pattern. And when you keep up with that pattern, that's why you get bitter. When someone tells you you're wrong. When God is not there to interfere on something unfair in life, and you get bitter at God and say, why God? Why didn't you help me out with this problem? You get bitter. Bitter. And guess what? Even if your feet is so diseased, you're going to keep turning to those silly doctors. Doctor fame, doctor prosperity, doctor whatever your fleshly weakness is. And you keep resorting to those doctors, and you never turn to the Lord. And you will die that way. Why? You think you're right. And that's dangerous. You better be careful of that attitude. You know what you should say? I'm just a sinner. I'm capable of sinning if I don't have the Lord in every instance in my life. If you were to do that, what can go wrong? Verse 12 through 14. 12 through 14. Relying on burials. Relying on burials. Now, what do you mean by that? Asa, there's no doubt, he relied on his plan, his way so much that even when he died, he only trusted himself, relied on himself. Because you know who prepared the burial? Not the Lord. He built his own burial. Yeah. I can't trust the Lord that I'm going to go my way with my disease. I'm going to go my way. And even if I die and get buried, I'm going to do it my way. Come on. Now, when you go to the kitchen and pick up your food, I want you to see that picture of a guy burning in hell and see the national anthem on that fridge. I did it my way. For some of you who don't know what I'm talking about, look at the lunch line next time we eat, and you'll see that. He relied on himself till the very end, no matter how bad his disease is. And God forbid one of you is there right now. That's so sad. I feel so sad for you is that you're so diseased in the feet that you hardly rely on Dr. Jesus. You rely on your own silly doctors. And there's a Ben Hadad and a Basha tormenting your life. And guess what? You're going to, you bury it so deep in your own burial. You planned out your own burial. It's so deep within me, preacher. There's no turning back. It's going to be, I'm going to bury myself with it and die that way. Isn't that sad? If you believe that, guess what? I'm glad you're wrong. Yeah. I'm glad the Lord's right. Amen. You know why? Because the Lord says right here, why did he use this language in the last part of verse 12? Yet in his disease, he sought not to the Lord. What did that mean? God said, God's pointing out he always had a chance. He always had a chance, but he didn't take that chance. I'm glad to tell you today that you don't have to bury yourself and stay buried in your weakness, in the thing that you're relying on that's causing a ben Hadad and a Baasha to torment your life. I'm glad that you're wrong today because I believe in the burial, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ more than your burial. I believe in a God that can bury the sin in the deepest part of the sea, bury the sin into the heart of the earth, bury everything and cover it under the blood. I have a great doctor. 
And God offers you that chance. Anyone diseased in the feet here, I offer you and God offers you another chance like he did every Sunday. Come to God and let Dr. Jesus heal you. Amen.